Well, I wish everyone uh, this this afternoon a, a very uh, warm welcome to uh, our uh, our Beacon Lecture here at St. Michael's College uh, and virtually uh, uh, those in Ireland and the UK it's currently supper time so we particularly thank you for for going a little bit of repast there for the first few minutes and uh, uh, we also have visitors I can see from from the United States uh, and uh, elsewhere and I knew that there was someone from Australia trying to get on the call as well. Um, my name is, if you don't recognize me in a tie, my name is Mark McGowan. I am the principal and vice president of uh, University of St. Michael's College and the University of Toronto. And uh, I'm also uh, a member of the Celtic Studies program in the Department of History uh, at the University of Toronto as well. Um, so I just like to acknowledge that the University of Toronto has been a site of human habitation for 1500 years. And it's the traditional historic territory of the Huron-Wendat people, uh, the Peyton First Nation, the Seneca, and more recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Um, today, the meeting place of Toronto is still the home of many indigenous people from across Turtle Island. And we are grateful to have the opportunity to work in this community and on that territory. And uh, although many of us on the call are in different territories, depending on where you are in Canada, um, that's where we at St. Michael's College and the University of Toronto are situated. And we're absolutely delighted uh, to have you with us this afternoon, this evening, uh, to really celebrate um, the second time that St. Michael's has been accorded the opportunity to deliver uh, one of the McGee Beacon Lectures from the Ireland Canada University Foundation uh, in the ongoing efforts uh, to share scholarship between Ireland Ireland and Canada uh, for, for Irish and Canadian people to engage in this particular case online uh, with topics of, of mutual concern and importance uh, and to do so within the context, at least today, of the Celtic Studies program at St. Michael's College, which was founded in 1979 and uh, remains one of those steadfast scholarly programs uh, engaged in Irish language teaching, the discovery of Irish culture, uh, Scots, Breton, and Welsh culture as well both uh, history uh, and music uh, and uh, all sorts of other things uh, that uh, uh, make the study of the Celts uh, such an interesting one for both students and the faculty. And I see many of my colleagues from the faculty uh, uh, on this call today. Um, our relationship with ICUF goes back to the very beginning when Eamon O'Keefe, then Minister of Gelhach Affairs, uh, came to uh, St. Michael's uh, to initiate uh, uh, the first of many uh, Irish language instructors. And I noticed that our current ICUF uh, instructor, Pa Sheehan, is on the call. And so a special uh, warm welcome to Pa as the, uh, the latest uh, iteration of uh, a, a very positive relationship. Those of you who were with us in October, remember that we offered the inaugural uh, ICUF McGee uh, uh, Beacon Lectureship with uh, former President Mary McAleese, uh, who gave uh, a very stimulating talk and engendered uh, a robust discussion uh, afterwards. And uh, we're hoping today uh, that, uh, not to put the pressure on uh, uh, Dr. Gannon, but for certainly um, uh, knowing that uh, his talk will be of, uh, of great interest uh, to you. In Search of Global Ireland, Locating the Irish Diaspora in the Deck of Centennials. And be before I, I introduce the, the CEO of ICUF, I just want to give you uh, very briefly uh, an overview of this native of uh, County Monaghan, uh, Dr. Dara Gannon, who is currently a research fellow to, uh, at uh, Queen's University Belfast. Uh, he's a fellow of the Arts and Humanities Research Council funded project, A Global History of Irish Revolution, 1916 to 1923. Um, he has numerous publications and I'll just name a few of them to, uh, to uh, first of all, get you interested in the kind of work that he's doing. Uh, Irish Academic Press in 2016 published his Proclaiming a Republic, Ireland 1916 and the National Collection. Um, currently and forthcoming from Cambridge University Press, his book, Conflict, Diaspora and Empire, Irish Nationalism in Great Britain, 1912 to 1922. As you can see, there's a pattern uh, emerging here that, uh, uh, that Dara is, uh, is deeply engaged uh, in the discussion and discovery of uh, this decade of, uh, of centennials. Um, uh, forthcoming as well is a book, uh, Ireland, 1922, uh, Independence, Partition, Civil War, 
and uh, and currently he's also writing a monograph called the worlds of revolution ireland's global movement or global moment rather uh, 1919 to 1923 so um, Dara and I actually met several years ago when I was teaching for the University of Toronto at Maynooth University, which is actually his alma mater, but we actually met when I was taking my students to, to Belfast for the day, and uh, he offered them a, a very short uh, lecture on uh, what he and Fergal McGarry and this large research project on uh, the diaspora and the decade of centennials uh, was producing. And so I was very excited that when we were given the opportunity to work with a, a young scholar from Ireland, uh, that uh, his work would really engender many questions among our own students and uh, among the community here, uh, and uh, perhaps expose uh, for the first time to some in Ireland uh, the work that's going on uh, under the, the tutelage of uh, Fergal McGarry uh, at Queen's University Belfast uh, and uh, Enda Delaney at the University of Edinburgh. So without any further ado, I'd like to turn over the, uh, the podium for, for, for a moment to James Kelly, the Chief Executive Officer of the Ireland Canada University Foundation. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mark. Um, and can I say that on behalf of the Ireland Canada University Foundation, it's our great pleasure to support this fellowship. Um, the Ireland Canada University Foundation exists for over 20 years, uh, has existed for, for over 20 years, uh, with the aim of building connections between Canada and Ireland. And for the most part of those years, uh, we've supported travel, uh, facilitating uh, Canadian researchers and academics coming to Ireland and Irish uh, traveling to Canada, o over 500 awards um, uh, since the beginning of the foundation. But it's not just about connections. We're looking to support connections which enrich our understanding of the world we live in. Connections between Ireland and Canada which contribute to our society and to uh, our planet. And connections which contribute to the lives of the people of Ireland and Canada and beyond, now and into the future. And for this reason, um, I, we are very excited to support this fellowship the work of uh, Dr. Dara Gannon will uh, enlighten sh stories shared by the people of Canada and Ireland. Um, so I'd like to congratulate uh, Dr. Gannon on the fellowship. And I'd also like, also like to thank you, Professor McGowan and your team uh, in St. Michael's University and the University of Toronto for approaching us with this, um, this proposal. As you mentioned, the Beacon Programme was launched with a lecture by uh, former president of Ireland, Mary McAleese, uh, uh, given to St. Michael's University uh, back in October. And uh, that was a really special occasion for everyone who was on that, um, on that video call. Um, and like today's lecture, uh, Professor or Dr. McAleese's um, lecture is available to view um, on our uh, video platforms and Dr. Gannon's video uh, or, or lecture will also be recorded and available for viewing in future. Um, and for anyone who's interested, uh, who's watching this, who might may be interested in um, re-watching this or sending a link on to friends or seeing any of the other uh, Beacon lectures which have occurred in the past uh, couple of months and there'll be many, there'll be many more over the coming months and years, um, my colleague Amanda is just going to put a link in the chat box so you can sign up uh, and for updates and we'll send you details. Um, so the Beacon program is, uh, this, this is the very, very public part of the Beacon uh, program and we're very excited that to see so many people uh, joining the call today and I've no doubt that this video will be of great interest to people over the coming weeks and months and years. Um, but the other element of this program uh, that people don't necessarily necessarily know about is that is the follow on element um, and uh, Dr. Gannon will engage with uh, Professor McGowan and his team and students over the coming weeks in a series of smaller events uh, that enable the development of uh, one to one connections and that's to us uh, really a really important aspect of this program building uh, personal links um, and it's really we're really seeing how 
despite the fact that this happens online, it, it does contribute to meaningful connections. And hopefully in due course, connections that, that may result in people actually physically meeting. Um, but that's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a conversation for another day. Um, so I'd like to, uh, at this point, also acknowledge the great support that we have, uh, the Ireland Canada University Foundation, or ICOF, from the governments of Ireland and Canada. This programme is funded by the Department of Foreign Affairs, the Irish Department of Foreign Affairs, through the Emigrant Support Programme, and we're funded by the Government of Canada through Global Affairs Canada. Um, I think that is all I was hoping to say. Um, so can I just close by wishing um, you, Dr. Gannon, Professor McGowan, um, and all your team and, and everyone uh, tuned in today and who's connecting into this fellowship over the coming weeks and months. I wish you the very best for this event. Um, I've no doubt that it will contribute to the great friendship and connections between um, St. Michael's College or St. Michael's University and Ireland, but also more, more broadly, uh, the connections um, between the people of Canada and Ireland. And as I say, the wider, uh, the wider world as well, who are tuning in. So um, without any further ado, it's my great pleasure to call on Dr. Dara Gannon to deliver the Beacon Lecture. Gravila Maigat, as in fall to Creole James. It's honor of his privilege more than the governor of Ireland Canada University Foundation, could a nask in your era of Canada and Yartu. Mesdames, Messieurs, c'est un grand plaisir d'être avec vous ce soir à l'Université de Toronto. J'espère avoir bientôt l'occasion de vous rencontrer au beau, campo, au beau campus de Saint Georges. I would like to thank particularly the faculty and staff at St. Michael's College, Adrian Ross for coordinating this truly transnational event, and above all to Professor Mark McGowan for guiding this project from concept to completion. As Mark mentioned, we first met at Queen's University Belfast in 2018, and it's my very sincere hope that we'll be able to see Mark in Belfast, the Toronto of Ireland, in due course. As Beacon Fellow at St. Michael's College, I am conscious that I'm following digitally in a centuries-long tradition of transatlantic education. Established in 1852 in the final throes of the Great Famine, St. Michael's will become a beacon of Catholic education and guidance for generations of migrants from Ireland. Almost 170 years later, it remains a sanctuary for scholars of Ireland and its diaspora. St. Michael's is home to the finest Celtic studies program and some of the foremost Irish diaspora scholars beyond the island. So I'm deeply privileged to be invited to join this community of Canadian Irish scholars as Darcy McGee Beacon Fellow. Adrian, if we can have the first slide, please. An author, an orator, a political leader, Thomas Darcy McGee was above all a citizen of the world. Traveling between Ireland, the United States and Canada, McGee undertook the political journey of a lifetime from Irish nationalist rebel to Canadian statesman. His breadth of experience facilitating the creation of cultural connections and political interventions across the Atlantic. Rereading David Wilson's magisterial two volume biography, I was struck by the extent to which Darcy McGee's words have resonated to this day. In his final address to the Canadian Parliament on the 7th of April, 1868, just hours before his assassination, McGee proposed, quote, I speak here not as a representative of any race or of any province, but as thoroughly and emphatically a Canadian, ready and bound to recognize the claims, if any, of my Canadian fellow subjects from the farthest east to the farthest west, equally as those of my nearest neighbor. We need above everything else, the healing influence of time. Time will heal all existing irritations. It will mellow and refine all points of contrast that seem so harsh today." Unquote. In the following remarks, I will follow in Darcy McGee's footsteps to reflect upon themes of time and space in search of global Ireland. The past is a foreign country. They do things differently there. Inherent in L.P. Hartley's irrepressible opening line is an aphorism on commemoration, memory, and history. 
the existential distance and therefore difference between past experienced and past remembered. An examination of any historical event must reconcile itself to this fundamental disjunction. The Irish decade of commemorations has done much to restore the Irish revolutionary past to, to the historical record and to impress historical memories on the collective consciousness. The dramatic series of political events, Ulster Crisis, First World War, Easter Rising, War of Independence, Partition, Civil War, have traditionally been understood as an island story. The Irish Revolution, by this geographical narrative, was the story of Ireland, North and South. A century after the facts, however, the geography of the Irish Revolution remains open to historical debate. As Enda Delaney and Fergal McGarry have recently observed, quote, to frame this event as taking place solely within Ireland flattens out the complexity of this global revolutionary movement and privileges the political entity that later became the independent Irish state. Such an approach would impose ahistorical boundaries which few contemporaries would have recognized or understood, unquote. Does the Irish revolution, as the possessive case suggests, belong to histories and historians of Ireland alone? To address this question in turn is to reflect upon a broader range of conceptual and thematic approaches to the study of modern Ireland advanced by scholars all over the world. Charting future directions in the study of the global Irish, American-based historian Kevin Kenny concluded, quote, wherever the Irish settled, nationalism became a means of expressing not only an ethnic but also an international or diasporic sense of Irishness that transcended any simple desire for acceptance in the host land. The development of diasporic sensibilities within nationally specific ethnic identities is an ideal subject for comparative inquiry, inquiry unquote. Surveying the field from New Zealand, Angela McCarthy has underlined the analytical value of networks by which to situate histories of Ireland in the world. Communication exchanges, flows of information and the role of social networks are all fundamental." Unquote. The argument for decentering Irish historiography has been advanced further by Canadian-based scholar Donald Akinson. Quote, our mission should be to chart Irish nationalism as a small but not insignificant global cultural system." Unquote. In 2017, I embarked on an AHRC-funded project between Queen's University Belfast and the University of Edinburgh, which sought to examine the global significance of the Irish Revolution, a scholarly journey around the world of 1,080 days, if you will. This research has taken me physically and digitally to archives in over 10 countries, from the National Library of Japan to the National Archives in India. In speaking to you this evening, I aim to present both the historical answers and commemorative questions gathered in my search for Global Ireland. How did Irish experiences of religion, empire and race around the world impact the revolution in Ireland? In what contexts can Irish academic scholarship integrate non-Irish history scholars and sources? And in what communities and commemorative spaces can the global Irish revolution be remembered? So we'll move to Canada now, please, Adrian. On the 11th of April, 1912, the third Home Rule Bill was introduced to the House of Commons by British Prime Minister Herbert Asquith. The Government of Ireland Bill provided for an Irish House of Commons and an Irish Senate. The Irish Parliament was to remain subordinate to the Westminster Parliament while 42 Irish MPs would still be entitled to sit in the House of Commons. Seeking to secure its safe passage through the Houses of Parliament, Irish party MPs often invoke the Canadian model as a parallel for Irish self-government. The Canadian federal government, as well as the provincial parliament of Ontario, had passed resolutions in supporting Irish home rule in the 1880s. However, it was on the subject of religious tolerance for which John Redmond most frequently referred to Canada. Quote, we demand that under home rule, we in Ireland shall be given the same chance as was given to the Catholics and Protestants in Canada." Unquote. On the 28th September 1912, Ulster Unionists led by Edward Carson and James Craig signed the Solemn League and Covenant in Belfast City Hall, opposing the introduction of, of Home Rule. In total, 237,000 men signed the document. A further 234,000 women signed the supporting Ulster Declaration. 
this date became enshrined in the commemorative calendar as the beginning of the Ulster crisis. Important work by J. McCahey, however, has highlighted the ongoing underlying influence of Protestant masculinities in the militarization of Ulster Unionism. It is perhaps the Canadian born leader of the Conservative Party, Andrew Bonner Law, however, who has the best claim to issue to be the first to issue rebellion in Ulster, proclaiming in July 1912, quote, I can imagine no length of resistance to which Ulster can go in which I should not be prepared to support them, unquote. To quote Owen McNeill via the Toronto Raptors, the North began. Canada, in turn, would become an important theatre of the unfolding Edwardian drama. By the late 19th century, the volume of Ulster Scots migration to Ontario was such that Toronto had become known as the Belfast of Canada. The Orange Order, indeed, could count on 150,000 members in Ontario West by 1914. We fight against betrayal and for civil and religious liberty. Will Canada help us? Carson wrote to one of its most senior members, the mayor of Toronto, Horacio Hawkin. In September 1912, over 5,000 Orange men protested against Rome rule in Ulster outside Toronto's Massey Hall, reports of which reached the Belfast Telegraph. Statuettes of Carson were sold to Orange marchers, one advertisement reading, quote, if you are a true orange man, you will show your appreciation of this man's great man's work by displaying his likeness in your home, unquote, unquote. In every sense, Torontonians were at home with the Ulster crisis. And this sense of proximity was reinforced by the news reports of Lisburn-born Robert Lindsay Crawford. The son of a Protestant scripture reader, Crawford had become the founding editor of the evangelical Irish Protestant newspaper in Dublin in 1901 later establishing the independent Orange Order in Belfast in protest at Carson and Craig's takeover of the Orange Order. Dismissed from the Irish Protestant newspaper for espousing conciliatory views towards Irish nationalism, he emigrated to Canada in June 1910, where he secured a post on the editorial staff of the Toronto Globe. At the height of the Ulster crisis in 1914, Crawford returned to Belfast to cover the passage of the Third Home Rule Bill, sending 60 dispatches to Canada between April and early July. As a Protestant nationalist, Crawford gained unprecedented access to nationalist and loyalist paramilitaries, being given a tour of Irish volunteer positions by Roger Casement. Framing the question of partition in economic rather than religious terms, Crawford's solutions, for example, a provincial parliament in Ulster within a federal Home Rule Ireland, borrowed heavily on his experiences of political life in Canada. Quote, in Ireland, as in Canada, a liberal allowance must be made in which political opponents speak of each other, unquote. He would later serve as the Irish Free State's first consul in New York. To reflect, the example of Robert Lindsay Crawford reminds us that contemporaries conceived of different visions and versions of Northern Ireland to that ultimately remembered by history. As we approach the centenary of partition, it is timely to think afresh how we can curate and make accessible global archives such as the Toronto Globe, which offer new transnational perspectives on themes of religion, ethnicity, and loyalism. By integrating international sources into the story of partition, we can restore alternative Ulsters to the historical record the past is a foreign country, they do things differently there. So we move to Great Britain, Adrian, please. On the 4th of August 1914, the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland went to war with Germany. This historical fact has, for much of the 20th century, belied historiographical truism. Ireland and the First World War, FX Martin diagnosed as late as 1967, was the subject of national amnesia. The consequent scholarship of David Fitzpatrick and Keith Jeffrey, among others, has been a palliative to Irish historical memory. By 2008, John Horne and a series of distinguished contributors could lend claim to the title, Our War. Studies of Irish diaspora communities during the Great War, notably Mark McGowan's seminal, The Imperial Irish, have been at the vanguard of this turn towards the trenches in Irish historiography. 
commemorative pluralism notwithstanding, it is imperative to remember the centrality of the First World War to Irish and British history collectively. In this important respect, the Irish in Great Britain are integral to recovering shared historical memories. Irish recruits to the British Armed Forces served king and countries in the Great War. The Tyneside Irish Brigade offers an insightful case study of a semi-nationalist formation. By January 1915, enrollment in the brigade had been completed, over 7,000 men having joined the ranks of the four Tyneside Irish battalions. Enlistment in the British Armed Forces was a clear marker of civic responsibility in British society. Members of the brigade, nonetheless, exhibited strong identifications of Irishness throughout their service at the front. The first Tyneside Irish Battalion named their huts Towers Hall, Hibernia and Killarney Cottage. And their wearing of shamrocks on British Army tunics on St. Patrick's Day 1916 illustrates the collective British-Irish identities of those citizen soldiers. Almost 600 members of the Tyneside Irish Brigade will be killed and 1,500 wounded on the first day of the Somme. In Easter 1916, 87 Irish volunteers from British cities took part in the Rising in Dublin. British-based Irish rebels can be conceived of as ethnically conscious objectors. Their preparedness to fight against the British Armed Forces in Dublin ultimately was a rebellion against the principle of citizenship through service foregrounded by the war. In Glasgow, the Monaghan-born Margaret Skinner would note of the growing militancy among advanced nationalists. The spirit among the younger generation is perhaps more intense than in Dublin because we are a little to one side and thus afraid of becoming outsiders, unquote. Practicing her marksmanship in a rifle club alongside women preparing to assist the British Army, Skinner reminded herself, quote, Scotland is my home, but Ireland is my country. Unquote. In the months before the rising, members of Common Man and the Irish Volunteers crossed the Irish Sea to evade British military conscription, earning them the disdain of Irish-born rebels who labeled them the refugees. The medley of Cockney, Scouse and Glaswegian accents in the GPO certainly made for an incongruous Irish rebellion. Margaret Skinner herself would be stationed at the St. Stephen's Green Garrison, operating as a sniper. Severely wounded during the fighting, having received three gunshots to the arm, she ultimately survived the rising. Leaving behind families, careers, entire lives, the defeat of the 1916 rebels effectively rendered British-born Irish volunteers, soldiers without a country. The case of Michael Collins offers an unlikely refugee story, success story for Revolutionary Ireland. Working in the Postal Office Savings Bank and a stockbroker's office in the city from 1906, the Cork-born Collins found an, an iconoclastic political home in London where he entered Gaelic League classes on bustling Oxford Street and was entered into the Fenian underworld by Sam Maguire. At weekends, Collins would join Maguire and Liam McCarthy on the fields of the London GAA. Sam Maguire and Liam McCarthy, however, were a long way from the hallowed ground of Croke Park. London GAA clubs were forced to play on public spaces such as Clapham Common and Wormwood Scrubs, while rugby rather than Gaelic goalposts often had to be used. From 1913, Collins and fellow London Irish volunteers navigated the hectic commute each evening to drill for Ireland at the German gymnasium adjacent to King's Cross Station. For Collins and other Irish-born British civil servants, London Irish life meant working for the British state by day and against it at night. Following his post-rising internment at Frangoch in Wales, Collins returned to Ireland, whereupon he utilised his London Irish connections to supply the IRA with weapons for the War of Independence. Writing to the British cabinet on the 9th of June, 1921, British intelligence sources noted, quote, it is, it is persistently reported that Michael Collins has been in London and that he went about disguised as a Roman Catholic priest, unquote. Four months later, on the 11th of October, 1921, Michael Collins was in London, entering 10 Downing Street. To reflect, Michael Collins's political journey from guerrilla leader to peacemaker has been widely commented upon. Of equal fascination was his British political journey. 
from discussion of Sinn Féin ideas at Hampstead Homes to their negotiation at the most famous house in the United Kingdom. Labelled disparagingly as one of the refugees by Irish-born rebels during the Rising, he was empowered by Irish Republicans to negotiate a treaty with the, the British government five years later in 1921. As a plenipotentiary, Collins was informed by both Irish and British political experiences. As we approach the centenary of the Anglo-Irish Treaty, it is imperative that debate on that historical event is similarly informed by collective understanding of Irish and British history. American and European history are both taught in the Irish education system. But if the shared past, shared future paradigm is to have any commemorative currency, it is surely time 100 years after the Anglo-Irish War to consider the teaching of British history in Irish schools. The past is a foreign country. They do things differently there. We move to Australia. The results of the 1918 general election in Ireland, Sinn Féin 73, Irish Unionists 22, Irish Parliamentary Party 6, were revolutionary in outcome. Of the 73 Sinn Féin MPs elected in Ireland at the general election, 27 took their seats on the 21st of January 1919 at the Mansion House in Dublin. Their assembly in the capital was to fulfil the electoral promise of Sinn Féin and the ideological promise of Irish nationalism, the establishment of an independent parliament. Standing before an audience of 1,000, the Sinn Féin MPs now presented themselves as Chakti Dála, or deputies of the Dáil. Proceeding as Gaelga, acting Prívara Cahal Brua proclaimed the legislative powers of the revolutionary government, comprising ministries of finance, foreign affairs, home affairs and defence. A declaration of independence, message to the free nations of the world and democratic programme were proclaimed, while Arthur Griffith and Eamon de Valera, both in prison, were delegated in absentia to address the Paris Peace Conference. In conclusion, the first Dáil constituted the first elected government of the Irish Republic. Writing from his constituency office in Liverpool, the Irish Party MP, T.P. O'Connor, conceded of de Valera, Collins and Markiewicz, quote, the Sinn Féin celebrities might arrest the, the attention of a hurried world better than our old world rational methods, unquote. Yet, 100 years after the polls have closed, the victory of Sinn Féin in 1918 remains open to debate. Did the 1918 general election swing the silent vote of the Irish diaspora for Sinn Féin? Beyond Ireland, the debate between Home Rule and Republic continued well into 1919. The Home Rule press in Australia significantly did not reproduce the extensive political discourse espoused by candidates at the general election in Ireland. The news of Sinn Féin's victory, when it did arrive, prompted inquiry as to the fundamental difference between old and new nationalisms. What is the precise programme of the Sinn Féiners, the Sydney Freeman's Journal inquired in January 1919. The long stated aim of Home Rule for Ireland continued to resonate among Irish diaspora communities alongside its more ambitious political successor, self-determination. And this has been demonstrated elsewhere by Patrick Mannion's important work on the Irish in Canada and Newfoundland. The blurred lines between home rule and self-determination were personified in Australia by the figure of Thomas Joseph Ryan, the Premier of Queensland. Born in Victoria to Irish parents, the University of Melbourne educated barrister had first been elected as a Labour member to the Legislative Assembly of Queensland in 1909, becoming head of the party three years later. In 1915, he would lead the first Labour government in Queensland's history, aged just 39. He publicly advocated for Irish home rule during his premiership. The defeat of the Irish party in December 1918, however, shook his confidence in the future of a home rule settlement. Returning from a visit to Dublin in the summer of 1919, in which he consulted both de Valera and John Dillon, Ryan conflated their respective causes in his comments on British rule in Ireland. Quote, I am satisfied that distrust cannot be removed by further promises or offers made by the government unless there is an immediate fulfillment of home rule. Ireland wants the goods delivered, unquote. Irish nationalism in Australia, for much of 1919, 
was defined by ambiguity. It was with this explicitly in mind that an Irish Waste Convention was convened in Melbourne on the 3rd of November 1919, attended by over 1,000 Australian delegates. Opening proceedings, Ryan declared, quote, this is a time when we should speak in language which not only can be understood, but which cannot be misunderstood, unquote. Many of the contributors emphasized the authenticity of their arguments by virtue of their Australian citizenship. The representative of Tasmania asserted, quote, we here enjoy the full fruits of self-government and living 16,000 miles away from Ireland, get the true perspective on Ireland's self-determination, unquote. The Anzac experience was deployed to buttress arguments, a New South Wales delegate declaring, quote, we Australians of Irish birth will stand loyal to the sacrifices of our fellows and see if it is in our power to do it, that Ireland is granted the same privilege for which Australians fought and died, unquote. Representations of political citizenship and civic sacrifice served as a prelude to assertions of Ireland's right to self-determination beyond home rule. The convention subsequently resolved to pledge their support uh, for the politics of Eamon de Valera and the Irish Republic. The Irish convention ultimately was an exercise in Australian political citizenship. A rally of 150,000 Melburnians in Fitzroy Gardens later that evening illustrated the point emphatically. So we return to Canada in 1919. Adrian, please. Ideas of Ireland circumnavigated the world through the movement of Irish nationalists across geographical and cultural borders. Among the most significant transnational figures was Catherine Hughes, who was born in 1876 in that cradle of confederation, Prince Edward Island. Paul Rigo Shields' formidable biography has indeed done much to recover her political trajectory. Hughes devoted the early years of her career to working with the Mohawk communities at the Aquasane Reserve on behalf of the Department of Indian Affairs. Her interest in indigenous communities led her to collect artifacts across Western Canada, a museological expertise for which she was later appointed provincial archivist for Alberta in 1908. Her political journey, which began in Edmonton, would continue in London from 1913, a secretary to Alberta's first agent general, John Reed. In London, she joined the Gaelic League, wherein she mixed in the same cultural circles as Michael Collins. Her transfer to the capital of empire transformed her political views from, in her own words, quote, a Canadian imperialist to a proper Irish person, unquote. Resigning her position, she became a key publicist at the Irish National Bureau in Washington, DC, later helping to plan Eamon de Valera's tour of the Deep South in 1919. Thereafter, she would join forces with the aforementioned Lindsay Crawford, establishing the Self-Determination for Ireland League of Canada and Newfoundland in Montreal in May of 1920. Trekking across the Canadian provinces, Hughes established SDIL branches in New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, Alberta, Saskatchewan, in addition to Ontario and Quebec. Her impressive coordination of Irish nationalist movements in different political environments led to a Pacific mission to establish self-determination leagues in Australia and New Zealand. And it's to New Zealand, Adrian, if you will, that we will now journey. In New Zealand in particular, Hughes's mission gained enormous public attention. In May of 1921, she addressed audiences in Auckland, Hamilton and Christchurch. Touring the North and South Islands on behalf of the Irish Republic, she also represented herself as a Canadian Irish suffragist. Speaking in Wellington, Hughes addressed diverse New Zealand audiences on the subject of women's rights around the world. Building on her experiences of public life in America, Canada and Great Britain, she contrasted their social reforms with the apparent indifference of public officials towards women in New Zealand. Quote, in Canada, the men were proud of the part women took in civic and political affairs and gave them every encouragement. The capable women who entered public life continued to be mothers and homemakers as well, unquote. Returning to Canada in the summer of 1921, Hughes received an invitation from Eamon de Valera to travel to Paris 
to organize an Irish Race Congress. With typical eloquence, she would later describe herself, quote, as a once upon a time Canadian, unquote. To reflect, the focus on the first doll in Dublin in Irish historiography and state commemoration has firmly affixed the memory of an Irish constitutional tradition to that historical time and place. Too close a reading of Dublin, 21 January 1919, however, can leave commemorations short-sighted. The development of Irish democracy was discussed by conventions of Irish nationalists all over the world. Philadelphia, February 1919, Melbourne, November 1919, Buenos Aires, November 1921. Significant movements to secure international recognition of the Irish Republic, moreover, were developed by figures such as T.J. Ryan and Catherine Hughes, neither of whom were Irish born or elected. The past is a foreign country, they do things differently there. Will the commemoration of the treaty debates allow for the alternative diaspora voices and views expressed a century ago? The mediation of the global challenges and unique contexts facing Irish communities around the world through digital platforms, such as the Global Irish Diaspora Congress, would leave behind a legacy to remember on the 7th of January, 1922. And finally, we journey to South Africa. A Global Irish Race Congress was in fact first proposed by the Irish Public and Association of South Africa, which had been established in Pretoria in 1920. From the vantage point of the Cape, Ireland appeared on the horizon, a worldwide Irish community. Quote, it is not the Ireland of four millions that we are thinking of now. We are thinking also of the greater Ireland, the Magna Hibernia across the seas, the millions of Irish people throughout the world. Though these Irish are now citizens of their adopted lands, they must not be, and they are not, wholly lost to Ireland. They also share in the great destiny of their motherland, unquote. The most effective political strategy underpinning the Race Congress, its South African organizers emphasized, lay in its presentation as an initiative of the global Irish diaspora. Quote, the great point our association would like to make is that we who attend this conference have not rallied at the call of the motherland, but as citizens of dozens of different countries throughout the world, united by ties of sentiment to Ireland. The first essential for success is spontaneity and detachment from Irish control. Unquote. The Doyle Department of Foreign Affairs, however, soon took charge over the convening of the Congress to the marginalization of its original South African organizers. Quote, with regard to the question of control, Assistant Under Secretary for Foreign Affairs Robert Brennan wrote, it is thought best that the guidance should be in the hands of the people at home here who are best acquainted with the situation and know what best is required, unquote. Between the 21st and 28th of January, 1922, 100 Irish nationalist delegates descended on Paris from Newfoundland, New Zealand, Australia, Great Britain, and South Africa, in addition to Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Mexico, Belgium, France, Spain, Italy, Java, and of course, Ireland. The representatives of the Self-Determination for Ireland League of Canada and the American Association for the Recognition of the Irish Republic refused to travel to Paris, quote, in the belief that the division of opinion in Ireland would nullify the Congress and its effectiveness, unquote. The clearest divisions arose, however, not over the Anglo-Irish Treaty, but in the different national allegiances and ethnic identities invoked in the name of Global Ireland. Addressing the congregation, one Australian delegate stated, quote, we must frankly and unequivocally accept the nationality of the country we are living in. It would be a vain thing for me to ask any young Australian to be an Irishman first and an Australian after." Unquote. The representative from the Cape echoed these views, quote, we took our stand as South African citizens. We who come from abroad come here owing an undivided political allegiance to the country of our permanent residence, unquote. Other representatives, however, rejected ideas of foreign citizenship. The Irish delegate for Argentina declaring, quote, you have them far away, the Irish community fighting continually against absorption into a very attractive civilization, namely the Spanish civilization of South America, unquote. 
the delegates from Great Britain were most vociferous in their opposition to a correlation between ethnicity and citizenship. Quote, we Irish in Scotland do not accept the nationality of the country in which we reside. We continue to be nationals of Ireland, temporarily resident in a foreign country, unquote. In bringing together delegates from across the world, the Irish Race Congress served to highlight the innate differences in national outlook between its diaspora communities. Delegates from Ireland, in fact, were rendered almost silent observers to this diaspora-led discourse. Quote, you must be patient with us who have come from distant places, one delegate advised the onlooking Countess Markiewicz, but we have to tell you of certain things that we have to encounter and that we are encountering all the time, unquote. Tensions between nationalists from Ireland and its diaspora would emerge over the course of the week-long Congress, notably over membership of the proposed new global Irish organization, Fianna Gael. When the representative of Brazil proposed that Sinn Féin TD Michael Hayes resign from the committee, the latter sharply replied, quote, I will not be interrupted by a Brazilian from Ireland, unquote. Others were dissatisfied that the election proceedings had not allowed for sufficient representation from their communities. There are about 600 in France. There is an organization complete in Chile. I want Brazil to be in. The last day of the proceedings disintegrated into a shouting match between pro and anti-treaty delegates. Quote, the only thing we have to do is to agree to disagree, De Valera commented to Owen McNeill. Exhausted by their bitter debates, the delegate from Brazil would remark to the Irish representatives, quote, we are treated here at this conference as if we were little children, unquote. Significantly, for diaspora delegates who had traveled weeks and thousands of miles to be in Paris, the failure to refer to the Irish Race Congress before the treaty was passed was critical. We have come from the ends of the earth and it has taken a long time to do it, the delegate from Sydney commented. When we left Australia, it was taken for granted that the main purpose to be served by this Congress was that this meeting of the Irish assembled from all the seas of the world would be the most powerful lever for the effecting of that surrender of Dublin Castle." Unquote. The representative from Pretoria outlined the disillusionment of the South African delegates. Quote, the idea of calling the conference came to us in South Africa because we felt that in the struggle Ireland was maintaining against England, she could not only succeed through something that amounted to a revolution in the political constitution of the world." Unquote. The London-based Art O'Brien, finally, captured the disillusionment of many diaspora delegates on not having a vote on the treaty. Quote, it is unfortunate that by an accident, we were not called upon to do something we should have been called upon to do at the time. Unquote. To reflect, the Irish Civil War fundamentally altered the outlook of Irish nationalism from a global Ireland to an island Ireland politics, shifting the focus of Irish revolutionaries from the scale of their international achievements to the minutiae of intranational differences. A century of historical scholarship has reinforced the ourselves alone narrative of the Irish Revolution. The separation of the Irish diaspora from the historiography of the Irish Revolution to date speaks to the double marginalization of the Irish migrant from Irish society and its historical record. Fianna Gael has been written into the Irish history books as the 20th century political successor to the pro-treaty party. The Irish, Con Irish Race Congress-led organization Fianna Gael, by contrast, has been consigned to the footnotes of Irish history and the distant scholarship of diaspora Ireland. The worldwide movement of Irish nationalists are deserving of a historical legacy to remember. A century after the Irish Race Congress in Paris, significantly, the Irish state has returned to the idea and influence of global Ireland. So, to conclude, and if we can return to the main PowerPoint, please, Adrian. Thank you. Charting the contours of global Ireland during the Irish Revolution requires the historian to follow the lines of latitude and longitude set by Irish nationalists and unionists a century ago. Ideas of Ireland were communicated around the world by the geographical and cultural movement of transnational figures, such as Robert Lindsay Crawford and Catherine Hughes. 
Irish nationalism across the world was influenced by ethnic discourses specific to each host society. Canada, religion. Britain, citizenship. Australia, imperialism. South Africa, race. But it could also be effectively mobilized by diasporic identities as much as Irish island influences. The organization of the Irish Race Congress in Paris in January 1922 attests to the development of a global network of Irish nationalists. The gathering of representatives from 22 countries ultimately reinforced the global scope, but also the great divergences on issues of citizenship, ethnicity, and race, which defined Irish nationalism around the world. More indeed could have been said on the diverse experiences of diaspora communities in South America, the Caribbean, and Asia, notwithstanding the United States of America, had time and space allowed this evening. To paraphrase Darcy McGee's final speech in the Canadian Parliament, I have spoken here this evening as a scholar ready to recognize the contribution of Irish communities from the farthest east to the farthest west, as much as my nearest neighbor. The Irish Revolution was not only an Anglophone experience, it was not only a Western experience, indeed, it was not only an Irish experience. It is in the dialogue between Irish and internationally based scholars, Western and Eastern sources, and local and global histories that the geography of the Irish Revolution can best be mapped. To speak fluently of national histories ultimately is to think, write, and reflect in their second language, transnational history. Scholars of Ireland and Canada alike must remain historiens sans frontiers. So where do we go from here? The popular interest in history generated across the decade of commemorations has been historic. It need not be. History must have a place in the development of Ireland's global futures too. As Darcy McGee offered in his final speech, quote, we need above everything else, the healing influence of time. Time will heal all existing irritations. Time will mellow and refine all points of contrast that seem so harsh today." Unquote. The global Irish histories of the early 20th century raise critical questions of global Ireland's potential directions in the 21st. How can we identify and make accessible sources of migration between Ireland and Canada? How can we identify and make tangible the lived experiences of global Irish communities? How can we identify and make visible historic connections between Canada and Ireland? And how can we identify and make representative 21st century varieties of Irishness?" Unquote. In this evening's lecture, I have advanced ideas to address these commemorative issues in the areas of archives, education, media, and policy. However, as Professor Mary McAleese noted in her inaugural Beacon Lecture, quote, an army of scholars is needed to guide our thinking as we navigate the waters of the tough debates that still lie ahead, unquote. Moving forward, I look to scholars from Canada and beyond to come together in search of global Ireland as we negotiate the most difficult commemorations of this decade. Remembering the past is a foreign country. They do things differently there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dara. You've taken us on a, a sweeping journey across the globe and raised some very important questions. And with that in mind, uh, we have uh, a considerable time for, for a Q&A and, and Dara has agreed to answer uh, questions or address them anyway. Um, I ask you to keep your microphones muted and to use the chat uh, and uh, uh, I'll we'll uh, moderate the, the question period uh, for those who have questions for Dara. Um, and uh, uh, first question uh, from Barry O'Connor, uh, Dara, in the chat, and he says, why no serious consideration uh, I, of a federal solution instead of partition? Um, that's a really interesting question. And I think to go back in time and to think about, again, alternative ulsters, as I had suggested, the idea of a federal United Kingdom was actually broached around 1908 or 1909, um, but that was kind of abandoned by the time that they had moved on to 12. But I think it's a really valid point to make that there were international precedents, uh, most notably that of Canada, which I've mentioned, which potentially would have offered a, a, 
a constructive solution to the impasse between nationalists and unionists over um, home rule. It also should be pointed out that internal British politics played a part insofar as um, you know, the Irish party had the balance of power with the Liberals, so they didn't need to concede from their point of view the broader um, federal solution. But I think the arguments of Lindsay um, Crawford in the Toronto Globe are a fascinating insight into ideas of Ireland outside of the island. And I think we can very helpfully think about partition, past, present, but also future, uh, by exploring those alternative ulsters that those you know, alternative commentators offered. Thanks, Dara. There's a, another question here, and this is uh, from Paul Nugent. And the question is, can Dara speak to how the Irish Revolution and its emissaries in Paris and elsewhere affected other nationalist movements? Um, and uh, Paul says, I have heard that Irish diplomats met Ho Chi Minh in Paris, though I've been unable to track any documentary evidence. You're not alone, neither have I. <laughs> uh, but that's primarily because of COVID. The, um... So Ho Chi Minh did, with, made, did meet with George Gavin Duffy, who was one of the two Irish delegates, Sean Kelly and George Gavin Duffy, who led the Irish delegation in Paris. Um, the archives of the Prefecture de la Police in Paris have those uh, materials, but as far as I'm aware, they're currently closed. But other scholars have seen those files. And um, there was a, certainly a contemporary moment in 1919, which was very much a, a global anti-colonial moment we have Saad Zaglul, the Egyptian nationalist leader, meeting with um, Gavin Duffy and Shanti O'Kelly in Paris, Ho Chi Minh, who you mentioned, um, and others besides. So they were, you know, um, exchanging ideas in the social milieu of Paris. And there very much was this idea of, as I've written elsewhere in my forthcoming book, this idea of uh, salon culture and high society. So you would exchange ideas with like-minded people who are of the kind of the bourgeois class, almost in the sense of a cosmopolitan nationalism. Um, rather than let's say the provincial spaces of Munster where Tom Barry was a, you know, a key figure in the Irish revolution, people like George Gavin Duffy and Sean O'Kelly exchanged ideas with transnational activists in metropolitan spaces um, and very much presented a cosmopolitan um, Irish nationalism in that respect. A, a question, Dara, from uh, Dominic Bryan. Uh, he says, great talk, and I'm sure there are many who agree with you, uh, uh, Dominic. Uh, so much evidence of the constitution of ranges of nationalism. Say more about Lindsay Crawford. What an extraordinary political journey he went on. Very much so, and thanks, Tom, for the question. Um, Lindsay Crawford is someone who I'm just absolutely fascinated by. I just read through the, the globe and I'm very grateful again to, to Mark and Adrian for getting me access to the library um, at St. Mike's and again another example of the importance of international sources and making those available to Irish scholars and vice versa. But Lindsay Crawford's political journey from um, you know unionist to nationalist from Ireland to Canada from Belfast to Toronto I think is symbolic of the potential which for ideas to travel the world during this period um, and I think it's significant as well that in Canada, he developed perhaps a more expansive idea of what Ireland was and certainly what Ulster was. Um, and it's also significant that he teamed up later with Catherine Hughes, another global influencer, again, a term for my forthcoming book. Um, and it's important to recognize, as I pointed out earlier, that neither of these were elected in terms of, you know, receiving a salary, having the mandate of the Irish people to act on their behalf, but nonetheless, were tremendously influential in informing discussions about um, Irish democracy, informing diaspora discussion about Irish democracy. Um, and I think in terms of becoming the first consul of the Irish Free State, again, this idea of the past of foreign country, clearly Lindsay Crawford's contemporaries recognized his contribution to the Irish Revolution. And I certainly would like to see the Irish state doing similarly in the next few years. Thanks, Dara. A question from Shane Lynn, who is uh, one of our PhD candidates in the Department of History and one of David Wilson's uh, students. Shane asks, if you had time to incorporate the United States in your overview, how might you have fit the Irish American experience slash contribution alongside of that of communities in the Dominions? It's a really important, um, really important question. And again, as I stated in the conclusion, I, I just 
did enough time in the 40, 45 minutes or so. Maybe we'll organize a sequel, Mark, if you're interested, <laughs> a sequel lecture. But um, I think in the United States, there are different tensions. I mean, race is very clearly important in the experience of the United States um, in terms of Irish nationalism and the work of um, Ken Kevin Kenny, William Nyan Gray and others has clearly delineated that, but there's clearly more to do in terms of bringing out um, identities of Irishness beyond, let's say, the East Coast um, and beyond the major metropolitan areas. And again, digital sources have an important point to play there. I also think it's really important that while Devil Air's tour of the States gets a lot of commemorative and historiographical attention, it's important to recognize the differences of opinion on the path of American-born Irish nationalists and Irish nationalists traveling in the States. Um, and this is, of course, borne out in the cleavage between Kohalan and De Valera over his Cuban analogy, and which I've written before. But I think it's really important to recognize the, um, the, I, the identities of Irishness which emerge from different spaces and how those um, change over time and over space. Um, and again, Catherine Hughes is a remarkable figure to potentially track that, given that she traveled the Deep South um, you know, where this idea of whiteness was so integral to discourses of Irishness, certainly in De Valera's speeches, and yet when she traveled to um, across Canada, there was maybe a more um, liberal, more inclusive Irishness, which was communicated to audiences and more imperially minded than those of Irish American nationalists. So I think this is still a very rich and varied field. And um, I, one of the things I'd like to discuss perhaps I didn't have time, was I think one of the key tools which we can use going forward to explore the global Irish revolution, and the global Irish diaspora story more broadly, are edited collections, where we have the voices and perspectives and expertise of different scholars um, and their different collections and archival access to archives. So I think going forward, uh, collaboration, again, should be integral to what we do as scholars. Thanks, Dara. No. Kevin Kenny, whom you mentioned, is actually on the call. I noticed him there uh, earlier. Um, and although he apologizes, thinking that the question is too similar to Shane's, I think it, it does bear some uh, reflection. He says, studying the Irish globally decenters the United States, an important accomplishment. But does the Irish American case conform to the global pattern? Or dare I say, is it exceptional? So mm -hmm. a bit of a shift on, on uh, uh, Shane's question. Those are really important questions in their own right and you know certainly give me food for thought i certainly think the irish american experience of the irish revolution was so predominant in the in the english-speaking world certainly from 1919 that it's impossible to overlook its importance however i think as you move beyond in time and space into 1921 in particular we see a more global experience of Irish nationalism. I mentioned Catherine Hughes visiting Australia and New Zealand. The Irish Department of Foreign Affairs translates documents into Mandarin and to Japanese. Um, so I think the United States is absolutely integral to our readings of the global Irish revolution and to the story of the global Irish in the past. Um, but it's not the only story. And I think certainly the Irish revolution, there's considerable scope um, to further unpack other alternative voices and views, but also to look at synergies. And I'd be very interested, for example, to see how, you know, Catherine Hughes's remarks were received in the United States. Um, I could look into, for example, the Irish Race Congress, how that was commented on in the Irish American press and so on. So there are lots of parallels and I still think we need to follow those lines of latitude and longitude from the United States and, and, and across the world um, as we go through the Irish Revolution and beyond. So really important questions. Thank you. Thanks, Dara. Gerald asks, uh, to what degree do you think transnational exchanges between Ireland and specific countries were influenced by various nationalist organizations, for instance, the IRB in Ireland and the Clan Gael in America? Absolutely, very much so. Um, so those organizations, such as the IRB, which were themselves transnational, are vital in terms of developing those networks for um, certainly diasporic exchanges. I'm not sure in the sense of transnational exchanges, um, if they were as important. The IRB, Clan Gael in particular, of course, were a secret, a covert organization. 
And so therefore their public faces were perhaps more expressive, if you will, of this transnational discourse. So I'm thinking of Friends of Irish Freedom, for instance, um, you know, who, you know, um, engaged, members of who engaged, whom engaged with people like Marcus Garvey in New York. Um, and the, the, the self-determination leagues as well in Britain, Australia, Canada, and New Zealand, which I've outlined. I also think it's really important, and I highlighted this in the lecture, to recognize the importance of the individual. If we are to transcend the world in our study of the Irish Revolution, I think individuals, as much as organizations, are paramount, because not only do they travel, uh, as the case of Catherine Hughes or, or uh, Lindsay Crawford, but even through their reading, you know, books, literacy, reading, they are exchanging ideas uh, with nationalists all over the world. Um, and it's really important as well to look at individuals who, by definition, are always located. So Catherine Hughes in Wellington, Catherine Hughes in Montreal, you know, what does it, her discourse in Montreal say about Irish nationalism distinctive from her discourse in Wellington? So I think this idea of individuals, I would say, is the most important methodological tool which we have to traverse the world effectively, efficiently and accurately. Thanks, Dara. Just uh, switching tacks here, Mary Naliri asks, why has the Irish Soviet of the early 1920s, which was strong in Munster, been almost written out of the contemporary narrative? Um, that's a really good question. Um, I mean, there have been plenty of books um, written on, you know, Irish labor. I see Emmett O'Connor here is on this call and he's perhaps the, uh, the leading scholar of that subject. Um, but yeah, I think that's a really interesting question. I think one of the things which we can explore going forward is the idea of revolutions in the plural and to look at the Irish revolution in that context of revolutions and how they how they operated the dynamics of revolution. So obviously the Russian revolution, the Russian and um, the Ukrainian revolution, the Mexican revolution was contemporary to events in Ireland. And so even taking ourselves out of the diaspora space, there are very interesting parallels which we can explore. And again, one of the uh, boundaries or borders which we have to traverse in that respect is language. Um, you know, understanding and reading comparative revolutions very often requires an understanding of a foreign language. Um, so I think potentially things like the Lyric Soviet, it might be of interest, for example, to work with scholars who work on the Russian Revolution and get their perspective, integrate non-Irish history scholars and get a sense of how they evaluate the Limerick Soviet. You know, and Morris Casey, who's also here on the call, is working um, on radicals um, during this period. And I know that you know, that's something that's very, he's very interested in. Um, so I think there are aspects of radicalism which can be further explored. And again, even though the uh, Irish Decade of Commemorations formally ends in 2022, um, you know, the, the study of same continues. Thanks very much, Dara. I'm going to go back and uh, Kevin Kenny again. Uh, one of Patrick Mannion's key insights is that political slash nationalist ideas don't simply move in one direction from Ireland to places overseas of overseas settlement. He shows, for example, how ideas spread eastward from Toronto to the eastern seaboard. What are you finding about the circulation of ideas in the diaspora more generally? I think that's an absolutely vital point. And again, this idea of decentering the Irish Revolution in an ideal world, if, you know, um, I had more time, we could potentially like, start rather in that in Belfast or Dublin, but start in places like Melbourne or Toronto and, and explore in more depth how those ideas impacted on, on revolution in Ireland. I mean, that's been one of the key themes or strands of our project, the Global Irish Revolution Project, and it's something which I've tried to write on, for example, working on um, Eamon de Valera's Cuban rhetoric and how that impacted on divisions within Ireland, which led to the Anglo-Irish Treaty, for instance. But there's so much more to be done, and Patrick, Patrick's work is exceptional in demonstrating how ideas in Canada um, move throughout the world and changed according to different spaces. So I think there's considerable scope for uh, collaboration in that respect and for future research. So I think I'm really excited to, to um, think about that new direction going forward. 
Thanks, Tara. And this is a shameless plug for Patrick Mannion because he was also a researcher on this project. And, uh, and uh, we say quite proudly, he's a PhD graduate from the University of Toronto. So uh, um, it's good to see him cited a number of times today. Um, I'll go to Angus's question, uh, Dara. He says, do you think there is a need to recognize or even an earlier dimension of diplomacy or proto-diplomacy that was forming well before the 1916, uh, before 1916 when nationalists were building networks of global support? Would you agree with these earlier transnational links uh, provided a foundation for the more formal diplomatic formations you described between 1919 uh, and 1921? Again, a thought-provoking question. Um, I certainly think there's, to go back to the idea of, you know, when to begin the Ulster crisis, so to speak, or when did the Ulster crisis begin, I certainly don't think that those diplomatic links began on the 21st of January 1919 with the establishment of Dáil Éireann. Um, and you look at people like Roger Casement, who in a way comes a little too early for the project that I've been working on, which essentially started in 1916 and moved forward. But he's potentially the most, um, perhaps the most, um, most recognizable representative of Ireland globally at that time in terms of his, um, his work in Peru, and the Congo in terms of um, native communities and so on. Uh, and again, went on a political journey from being kind of the arch imperialist recognized by the monarch to being an Irish rebel. Um, so I think those kind of early networks can be very usefully explored. Another one is um, Arthur Griffith, who spent his formative political years in South Africa. Um, and, you know, looking at his potential connections, ongoing connections with South Africa is something I'd like to do. So there's lots of scope there to be looking at those, as you mentioned, the kind of proto-diplomacy. Um, you know, I'd be very interested to, the, this, to look at this idea of the long revolution in that respect. Um, how do those networks change pre-1916 and after 1916 when we think of old and new nationalisms? Um, I mean, Roy Foster's work has clearly demonstrated that there was changing of the guard in terms of generations, for example. But it would be interesting to look at how, for example, the networks of Patrick Pierce contrasted with the, you know, networks of Irish diplomats in 1920. So again, um, considerable scope for, for, for future collaboration. I'm, I'm grateful to hear. Thanks, Dara. Uh, Emmett O'Connor has chimed in and said the Doyle actually sent an envoy to Moscow in 1921. So that dovetails with Mary's question. Um, as I'm sort of waiting for the chat to heat up again, I have a question of my own of a, of a, of a global Irish network that Colin Barr mentions in his most uh, recent tome, uh, and that is the Catholic Church and, and how the Catholic Church, which is also an organization that's uh, transnational and represented in all of the countries that you have uh, identified, you know, had, had various spokespersons who seemed to differ from uh, Mannix uh, in, in Melbourne to Fallon in uh, London, Ontario to O'Dwyer in Limerick uh, and uh, even O'Connell in Boston. I mean, uh, what kind of role does the church internationally play, particularly in, in what, uh, what Colin Barr would say, like the late versions of Ireland's empire, ecclesial empire? Yes. Colin's work is formidable. And I should say that uh, when I first met Colin in Cambridge, he uh, mentioned to me that in terms of archives visited, he was on 99. So he has surpassed my uh, tally of international archives visited. So I, I'm very um, conscious that he traversed the world before our project had even begun. But I do think that the Catholic Church is a really important network, which I could certainly do more to explore. Um, and I think those figures you mentioned, Mannix in particular, who, I mean, I could have easily used him instead of Catherine Hughes, who, you know, traversing the world, you know, from Melbourne, traveled to the United States, met De Valera, um, embargoed in Great Britain, uh, went to the Vatican critically, and, you know, um, essentially prevented a denunciation of the IRA. Uh, by Benedict XV, the Pope at the time, through his interventions and, and intercession. So those figures are really important. And if you look at the Irish story in Rome in, in particular, and I, I know that um, 
Georgetown University are hopefully digitizing the Monsignor Hagen collection. I see that Colleen Parsons is on the call. Um, those collections from Rome really unpack this idea of a global um, network through the Catholic Church and the importance and power of the Catholic Church at the time really can't be understated or, or um, overstated rather. Um, they had access to, you know, political offices, which Irish nationalists by themselves would not have. And they held great sway over their congregations. Um, and in a way that I guess reinforces the idea of the past as a foreign country. You know, we have come a very long way, certainly in Ireland, in terms of the idea of the Catholic Church representing um, Irish nationalism in terms of publicly. So I think it's important to recognize that things were different 100 years ago, and those figures, Mannix, um, and others were, were really important. And I think people like Mannix, I, again, would consider a global influencer in that respect and certainly could. Um, and Val Noon, who again see, uh, is on this call. I have, I have to give Val perhaps the prize for getting up earliest in the morning, considering he's in Melbourne, um, has done extraordinary work on, on, on Archbishop Mannix in that respect. So again, more uh, much done, more to do. Yes, nice shout out to Val uh, Dara, who he did get up at 5 a.m. Uh, Australia time in Victoria to, to take in the lecture. So we are truly global today in, in, in many ways, and it's good to have Val on the call. Oh, from my colleague David Wilson, uh, could you comment more on the transnational dimensions of Orange opposition to Home Rule Easter 1916 slash Irish Revolution? What kinds of transnational connections do you find and what kind of differences across different countries? That's a really good question and it's something that I will need to explore um, further. Um, it's probably perhaps one of the truisms of, of Irish history as you know, I've experienced that is that nationalism tends to be better documented um, than unionism, um, certainly on, on this island. Um, but it's certainly something I'd like to explore further, especially obviously in Canada, but also in places like um, Australia, New Zealand. I mean, Don McGrath has done extraordinary work on the Orange Order in transnational perspective. David, your own work as well on the Orange Order is absolutely paramount to our understanding of this period. Um, and I think it's an interesting area of exploration, certainly as we move towards this idea of, well, this, this time of partition, commemoration of partition, to get a sense of ideas of Ulster which transcended that polity. Um, so I, th I think that's something which could be very helpful going forward in terms of the historiography, but also in terms of commemoration. And there's a very important role for Canadian scholars in particular who you know, have documented the importance of the Orange Order to this period to contribute to this international conversation, which I hope I've helped develop this evening about the Irish um, revolution. And I think in a way, there has been a sense in terms of the decade of commemorations of thinking about, um, while the North began, in Owen McNeil's famous phrase, that the commemorations of the same were quite soon over in terms of the First World War, Battle of the Somme, and there has been an absence perhaps of discussion about Ulster, the Orange Order, the afterlives of the uh, of Ulster Unionism, if you will, and hopefully going forward, as we you know speak of the centenary of partition, and um, Canadian scholars can be very important and integral to that debate. So I think to answer your question, I think there's so much more to discuss, to research, um, and it's something it's it's on my list. That's great, Dara, and uh, a good segue too, because we do have a PhD candidate in the history department who's looking at links between uh, the Ulster Volunteer Force and uh, uh, Canadian uh, Orangemen and Canadian Protestants uh, during this period. So um, we'll have to put you in touch with Nick Baker uh, as, as well. Um, the chat is now uh, has uh, dried up, but. Uh, Wait a minute, we have one more here and we'll, we'll make this uh, given seven minutes left in our session, Dara. Um, uh, Tim McMahon asks, uh, Dara, you may find some useful materials in the Ulster Unionist Council papers, re-imperial transnational appeals by unionists, especially after partition, dipping back into the 19th century, your discussion of diasporic communities shaping Irishness, even in Ireland echoes Kian McMahon's work have you ever considered the network of newspapers that uh, Keon highlights? 
Absolutely. And thanks again, Tim, for those insights. Um, yes, Kane's work is absolutely instrumental in this idea of the global Irish um, identity, albeit in an earlier period, and we have corresponded in that. Um, one of the one of the chapters of my forthcoming book, um, Worlds of Revolution, will look primarily at print. So not exclusively newspapers, but um, things like books, pamphlets, um, and so on. And this idea of um, going back to Kevin Kenny's point earlier about a circulation of ideas through print, which I have termed the Republic of Letters. Um, and in that respect, I think we could perhaps find alternative ideas about Ireland, um, also building on Richard Burke's work, this idea that there was an intellectual uh, milieu um, during this period, which has not always been acknowledged, I think it's vitally important. So I think print sources such as newspapers, but also books, pamphlets, which are perhaps more ephemeral are really important to our understanding of the Irish Revolution in a global sense. Something that needs to be stated, I think, as well, is that beyond the island, the experience of the Irish Revolution was primarily a reading experience. You know, um, the island of Ireland, as absolutely essential to this story, um, self-evidently as it was, um, was not the experience there was not the same as the experience around the world, where people read in the newspapers what transpired um, over their morning coffee or you know, in exchanges with others. And I think we need to recognize that you know, sources other than IRA memoirs in terms of print culture, which can inform our understanding of contemporary ideas of Ireland. And I think that's really important as well, even in terms of the British context, it was the British newspapers primarily reporting on reprisals, which actually impacted British public opinion. And this is well established in the historiography, um, but it's those cultural, those cultural mediators who so many of whom were not Irish and um, who were absolutely vital to providing um, interpretations of the events in Belfast and Dublin Cork for international readers. And without those kind of interlocutors, I'm not sure that the Irish Revolution develops as it does. Thanks, Dara. And that will be uh, our last question uh, for this session. And uh, all good things do come to an end. And we've had uh, many thanks uh, in the chat, and uh, particularly from our good friend Val Noon in Melbourne, who does win the prize today for having to get up the earliest uh, to attend this lecture. And, and uh, that's a consolation to, to all scholars on how keen um, uh, many are to, to hear you, Dara, and to, and to think about um, the Irish experience globally uh, and uh, in new and exciting ways. Thank you so very much for your talk. And uh, as a hint to others, this is, uh, uh, Daryl will be with us for four sessions and uh, you can contact my office at the University of Toronto uh, and uh, my, my trusty assistant will uh, see if there is room in four sessions uh, that uh, Dara is going to be uh, hosting. Um, in Search of Global Ireland, Archives, for those of you interested in archival sources. The second master class uh, in Search of Global Ireland Museums, so those interested in material culture and uh, museology. Uh, in Search of Global Ireland Media, uh, which is uh, apropos and uh, to, the, to the present context particularly. And the final master class uh, in Search of Global Ireland Policy. Um, and uh, uh, so, if you contact my office at uh, St. Michael's at U of T, um, we'll see if there are still openings in these small, uh, small group sessions of about 20 people that uh, will be more seminar-like than, uh, than, than lecture format. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, ICUF and particularly James Kelly for the support that you've given this program. So important linking not only Ireland and Canada, but as we've learned today, um, Ireland, Canada, the UK, the United States, Australia, uh, and points in between. And it's a very important experience that we have online that we might not have had uh, under, uh, how should we say, pre-pandemic uh, circumstances. Um, and finally, I'd like to thank uh, the, um, the mastermind behind uh, the technology this afternoon, and, and uh, that's Adrian Ross, my assistant. Uh, there he is. He's appearing on the screen. I don't know what I would do as principal without Adrian, but particularly at these sessions when uh, uh, the old principal is emphasizing old and uh, not terribly up to date. But uh, thank you, Adrian, for all of your work. 
thank you all for joining us and uh, uh, stay tuned because uh, Celtic Studies at St. Michael's has, has more things planned uh, in the future and uh, you'll be very welcome at those uh, as well. And I'd also like to thank Jean Tallman who always man manages to, to cast a, a very wide net among the friends and uh, uh, Irish uh, uh, expats uh, to draw you into these events. So thank you as well, Jean. And on that, I wish you adieu. I wish you a very happy uh, Easter, which is coming up. And uh, until we meet again, good night and good afternoon. <laughs>